<laughs> okay. Right, so um, y you know who I am. My, my job today is to speak about uh, meso zeaxanthin, and because we're, we're stuck for time, I I'll try and get to the meat of the, of, of the presentation quickly. In addition to that, a lot of the points that I wanted to make have been brilliantly made by John already, so I, w I won't try and outdo that. Um, just a little bit of clarity and uh, disclosure. I'm like, like a lot of people in this room, I, I do research and I do research for a lot of different organizations that have commercial interests, but I just wanted to make the point that while that is the case, and in addition to consultancy work, I, one thing that remains constant is that I keep my scientific independence and editorial control. Um, okay, so I'm going to acknowledge my, my, my team first and, and uh, the Waterford Institute of Technology <coughs> Um, it's appropriate today that I see uh, Michael Griffith in, in the audience from Ireland, from Fighting Blindness Ireland, and I'm, we're delighted to have him here because in 2001, Professor Beatty and uh, Mr. Griffith um, met about the possibility of studying macular pigment, and, and this is really how it, it developed in Waterford. So, like Lisa, I'm also a decade um, studying this eye pigment, and very grateful um, to be given that opportunity. Um, one thing I, I think that is uh, important about the, the research we do in Waterford is the um, in-house multidisciplinary approach, the expertise with ophthalmology, biochemistry, statistics, vision. Um, it, it's it's in-house, and I, collaboration with the hospital access to patients. I think this does give us a unique opportunity to to run to run clinical trials. I just wanted to make that point um, as well. So background. Um, We've been told today uh, about the carotenoids, plant pigments found in nature. There's a lot of them in nature. And as, as it gets into the body and eventually goes to the eye, we see how selective the uptake of these carotenoids can be. One thing came out in, in yesterday's session. Um, David made the point that um, lutein um, is, is, is the most commonly um, taken in carotenoid, macular carotenoid. But it's, it's in very low amounts even at that. So we're not consuming a hell of a lot a lot of this pigment um, fr from our diets um, in comparison to, to, to other uh, vitamins and minerals. But the selectivity here is that we have three of these in the macula. We've seen the structures, we've been told about the, the uniqueness, the similarity, but yet how they may function differently. And I believe that they, they, they are very different in their roles and that they, they all have a unique role. And um, we need to try and understand and learn that. But leafy greens, colored fruits and vegetables are how we essentially um, obtain these uh, uh, macular carotenoids. And here, this is, um, for anyone who doesn't know anything about macular pigment, which is nobody in this room, of course, um, this is Max Nodderley's image, is probably the most important and influential image um, that our field has had access to, because it really tells you everything you need to know about this pigment with respect, again, to its biological selectivity, its location. And um, I think it's just a striking, a, a striking image. So it does, as John said, deserve mention time and time again. This is a slide that we've just actually built. Um, Stephen and I spent some time, I was doing a presentation in, 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 in Brussels for uh, a research grant, and we wanted to really think of a way we could explain the possible and the potential of macular pigment. And this is what we came up with. And um, I know it's cartoon-like, but we are very proud of it because it, it, it helps us understand. And let's just picture for a second uh, a fovea without any macular pigment. And we know this is possible because um, if you eat no fruits and vegetables and deprive yourself of that, you will have no macular pigment. In this situation, we have lots of short wavelength blue light incident on the retina. And in addition to that, due to the fact that we metabolize oxygen to stay alive, we have um, free radicals produced in large amounts in this part of the eye. And the issue here is, of course, that we can damage and destroy the important cells required for vision. However, the idea is that if we can enrich and optimize our macular pigment levels by nutrition methods, by lifestyle methods, by supplementation, that we can result in this optical filter that's pre-receptorial, that has antioxidant properties, and that has light filtering properties. And that's really why we're all here today, because of, of those properties. So I wanted to show you that slide too. Its implications, of course, for... Um, filtering light and being an antioxidant, we, we all are aware, are for age-related macular degeneration, which is, as we know, the leading cause of blindness in the developed world. And this um, epidemic disease, as we've seen from this morning's lecture, is going to continue to increase because of the aging population. And 
Again, I think it's important that we also remind ourselves of the implications that the disease that we're all looking at here has for the uh, patient. You know, we're looking at social independence destroyed. We're looking at the ability to recognise the loved one's face gone. And, you know, it, it, it's a massive problem. Not only is it a problem for the patient, it, it's a massive problem when we look at the economics of it, the cost of doing business with AMD is, is, is a significant problem and it's going to continue to get worse. So the more we can talk about carotenoids and nutrition, I think, um, the better. And that's, again, why we have potential, I think, to discuss funding opportunities with, with um, the lead stakeholders. Um, for Vision, we look forward to um, listening to um, Professor Hammond's lecture um, this week to speak about its implications for vision. And this is, of course, due to its um, ability to f filter blue light again. So we're all aware of uh, an issue um, with vision glare on a bright sunny day when we go out. It's very uncomfortable. And this, again, is due to uh, short wavelength blue light causing light scatter. And um, so, again, the idea is if we can optimize our macular pigment, we can positively impact on, on that. Another one, uh, blurring out of focus imagery. This is caused by chromatic aberration, again, due to our friend blue light. And I leave that discussion really to Professor Hammond because I know he'll go into it in a lot of detail in his slide, that, in his lecture. That gets me to mesozeaxanthin, and we've already seen these slides, but the message is it's there. It forms a significant part of um, the, the macular pigment. Um, as we've seen, it's believed to be generated from lutein by some kind of conversion. Maybe it's enzymatic, maybe it's light, maybe it's a combination. And that's definitely a question, I think, that needs further, for, further research. But it is uh, an important central part of our macular pigment. Um, and as I say, we've seen from Liz's work that you know, it, the conversion is, in fact, from lutein. And that's when we see the, the monkey studies that were deprived of carotenoid as proving the point that it's entirely of dietary origin. You will have none. You then give one group lutein only, the other group zeaxanthin only. You assess the retinas after that and you can see that the lutein only group had lutein and mesozeaxanthin, whereas the zeaxanthin group only had zeaxanthin. So that's consistent with the idea and it makes sense that lutein is the carotenoid that's um, isomerized. Um, the antioxidant effect of these carotenoids, we're, we're all familiar with them and we discuss them as having important functional roles, but are they all the same? Are they different? John discussed it for us and explained it brilliantly this morning. But um, a very important publication from Paul's lab um, concludes that um, the protective effect of the combination of mesozeaxanthin with lutein and zeaxanthin is... Um, has more potential than each of the individual carotenoids on their own. And this is consistent, I suppose, with a synergistic effect and a combined effect of antioxidants in combination. It also makes sense if you think about it, that if we're talking about a pigment that's made up of um, three parts, that if you can um, have the three parts there, that it, it is likely to function better. So I, th I think it's a very important publication from Paul's lab. Um, short wavelength light, again, do the We've seen that they're very similar in terms of how they absorb light. Their position in the, in the eye, obviously, based on their structure, is different. So having a combination here, again, of all three will extend out the, the wavelengths at which we can filter light. And I think that is the, also important. So the message from those uh, last couple of slides is that if we, if we believe that the antioxidant effect of the macular carotenoids is important, and if we believe that the light filtering effect of the macular carotenoids is important, the message so far for me is that having all three may be um, optimal to achieve those. Mesozeaxanthin is, is quite new. Um, you know, when I was told about five years ago that it could actually be uh, made available in supplement, I, I didn't believe it because it was, it was very new to me. But it was, it was um, something that I initially became interested in, and then I started reading the work from Richard and John. Um, but let's see what we know about it. Birds make mesozeaxanthin and concentrate it and other carotenoids in their retinas. Um, chicken retinas, 47% of total zeaxanthin is indeed mesozeaxanthin. Turkey, turkey retinas, 28%. And there's publications to back those statements. Um, if we look at skin from trout fed a diet rich in astaxanthin, you can see that there's mesozeaxanthin there. And also the Atlantic salmon deposits mesozeaxanthin within its skin. It's in supplements, it's in many supplements across the globe now. So this is how, how, how we get it. And it's from the marigold plant. There's, a, there's an isomerization 
um, transformation performed and now um, a supplement can be produced with up to 80% mesozeaxanthin. <coughs> so this is a, a process that's, that's routinely carried out in, in um, Mexico. I think it, in 2000 or 1993 was the first time that mesozeaxanthin was introduced into chicken feed and the idea there was that instead of having the hens very yellow, it was desirable to have a more golden effect and zeaxanthin was um, chosen. Um, to, to try and achieve that, the mixture of, 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 of the two to, to result in the more golden colour. As I say, fish skin is a dietary source of mesozeaxanthin. I personally don't eat fish skin, so I'm sure if I check my blood, which I've done in the lab, I'll have no mesozeaxanthin. Um, brightly coloured egg yolks fed from hens will also contain mesozeaxanthin, and we've seen from some of David's work um, um, that to be the case. Is it in other foods? I know Liz Johnson is working hard to try and see if it's there and, and find it. Um, the reality is there's, there's no real publications on that just yet, but I, I look forward to seeing Liz's publications and haven't, haven't spoken to her. She's yet to find it in many of the foods that she's tested. Um, another point to make here is that there's very few labs across the globe that are actually set up to quantify um, mesozeaxanthin. So it's, it's not something routinely looked for. Um, and we have some posters on, on the method today and the challenges that the method offers. So um, I hope you, you enjoy those presentations. Is it safe? Um, there's been a, a lot of uh, animal studies conducted and that have shown essentially, with, if we look at the um, no observed adverse effect level, you can see that the message is positive there with respect to its safety um, and the AMAs test as well confirmed that. With respect to human studies, I want to make a point that, you know, it's now been consumed um, uh, in 2006, for example, in Ireland, it, it came into to the market. And clinically, I know Professor Beattie um, recommends mesozeaxanthin for his patients. And, you know, the, the clinical message that's coming back, albeit in case-by-case -case situation, is, is extremely positive with no adverse effects. In addition to that, um, we have a poster today on the safety of human consumption over a period of time where we've worked with a clinical um, laboratory analysis, claiming laboratories in Dublin to assess safety, looking at liver, renal, all um, potential um, problems that consumption of these carotenoids may, may, may give. So the message so far, based on what we've seen and consistent with what we know about lutein, is that there seems to be no significant issues with consuming uh, mesozeaxanthin. Again, the fact that trials are now underway, I think Richard and John again were the first to do a supplementation study. This is uh, a publication from, from our group where we've shown that we do, individuals do in fact respond to consuming mesozeaxanthin and of course we know the other carotenoids as well. So this was a pilot study to try and get our methodology going and trying to see how um, AMD patients and how young normal patients responded to the supplement and the take home message from this paper was that they do in fact respond significantly in the blood and in the eye but I purposely not put the data from that here because I want to go into detail and some other data that I think you may find even more interesting. And that leads us to the most two study. This is a study supported by the, the Howard Foundation, Dr. Alan Howard and um, it was designed to again look at serum and macular response to different supplements because we wanted to see is, is, you know, is there a difference in how we react to a supplement that just contains lutein or a combination of these carotenoids and um, because that's obviously important because the end point here is that recommendations will be made to patients about how they can enrich and optimize their macular pigments. So this type of work I believe to be important. So here's the, the, um, the, the design, 72 subjects. 33, 36 of them were normal, 36 had early AMD recruited through um, Professor Beattie's clinic. Study visits here at baseline two weeks, four weeks, six weeks and eight weeks and our interventions were one of three. We had uh, 20 milligrams of lutein, two milligrams of zeaxanthin in one group with no meso. Group two had 10 milligrams of lutein. Um, 2 milligrams of zeaxanthin and 10 milligrams of meso and group 3 had only 2 milligrams of lutein and um, 18 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin. And obviously the reason for that is you cannot get pure mesozeaxanthin. We would have been interested to look at pure but as of now that's not available. I don't need to tell you about this. We've just had a, a, 
an excellent lecture on um, the measurement of macular pigment and this is I suppose stage two maybe stage three of the evolution of the um, wooden densitometer and um, that's what we use and we've tried every device by the way we've tried <laughs> Raman um, reflectance and this is the one that we will continue to use because of the reasons discussed today. We do invest a lot of time in the understanding and the method and the instruction to the subject and typically we will spend 40 minutes with, with our subjects to do trials and trials and make sure that um, the, the data is as, as one would, would want it to be. And that understanding from the subject is there and I think Billy made that point as well that it's a two-way process. Um, but this off offers customized flicker, and that, that's the point. So that's what we use. In the lab, we use HPLC, and we're working with um, David uh, um, on, on our methodology, developing our methodology. And as I say, you'll see some of the posters today where we're working on quantifying mesozeaxanthin from blood. Um, this busy slide, don't worry about it. It just shows you that there was no difference in any of these parameters um, in the groups at baseline. Maybe, I think... Um, there was a difference. No, there wasn't. At, at baseline, there wasn't a difference. So here's um, some of the interesting data following this interventional trial. So let's look at it, and we'll try and go through a group. One, remember, 20 milligrams of lutein. So this was the lutein response. And you can see 20 milligrams of lutein had a significant response there. You can see it was 228% increase, statistically significant. Group two, that only had 10 milligrams of lutein, but other had 10 milligrams of meso, 2 milligrams of um, Z, actually showed a slightly uh, better response on average in those subjects. And as expected, group um, 3 that had very little lutein showed a minimal response, but it did show a significant response in, in, in those groups. Um, in terms of zeaxanthin response, none of the interventions had a lot of uh, zeaxanthin, um, so the response was kind of as expected. Um, the group three had, had no, uh, none at all, and that's reflected in essentially the, the flat line there with no significant change. But the group one and group two responded similar, and that makes sense because they had the same amount of zeaxanthin in the intervention. Here's where it gets interesting, for me anyway, and um, this will generate some questions, and I, I want to bring these questions to, to the group today. Um, here's when we look at mesozeaxanthin response, and um, Let's look at group uh, blues, group three force. As expected, 18 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin resulted in the most significant response. Um, when we look at uh, group two, which had 10, you had a significant increase there. It didn't quite get to the levels that the 18 milligrams did, but it was a significant response. Um, by the way, th this data is for normals and AMD combined, and I'll explain why in a second. But here's the most interesting thing that we've seen. The group that were given high amounts of lutein, 20 milligrams of lutein and 2 milligrams of zeaxanthin and no meso, to our surprise and unexpected, we found that there was a significant increase in mesozeaxanthin in these subjects. Now, the initial thought is that methodology, carryover, I can tell you that we've looked at that, we've tested, we've rerun the samples. That is not the case. Um, the HPLC is set up, is, as you know, with the appropriate washout and so on. The blanks run in between are clear as day. And the provocative conclusion from this is that people that have are being supplemented with lots of lutein, 20 milligrams of lutein, um, there may be now evidence from this data to suggest that mesozeaxanthin is in fact also generated in serum. And I know it's a provocative statement, but it's something I'd like to discuss with you. Um, because the original hypothesis was that this just happens at the uh, retina only. But we can see clearly here, when there's high circulating levels of serum lutein, um, <coughs> over time there's a, there appears to be mesozeaxanthin. We're going to go and check it again, and we're going to go and work on it again. So it, it's just something I wanted to present today. In terms of what happened, the, the macular pigment data, this again is the baseline for those subjects, and there was no difference, I think, age we had to control for. <clears throat> Here's what happened. I've just picked one value that showed the central point, so it's the 0.25 degrees of eccentricity. Here's the type of response we saw. Um, not so consistent with the data that Richard was um, presenting this morning. We see this response a lot quicker, and that's what prompted me to ask that question about the types of, of supplements do they have an effect on how we, how we respond? But you can see here that the uh, 20 milligrams of lutein 
and the 18 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin appeared to give a similar response centrally. Um, but the combined supplement, again, had a significant, if you look at the time uh, supplement interaction effect, it, it was absolutely there, even though they were both um, significant. So the optimal enrichment was achieved when all three um, were present. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself that this isn't just due to concentration. I, I, maybe the fact that when you supplement with a combined effort that there, there's some form of support for uptake. And I don't know, again, this, this data is asking so many questions, but um, very important ones, I believe. The other interesting thing that I wanted to present from that data was that, consistent with the LUNA trial, that in terms of how people respond, the rate at which they respond, and how much they could respond to, we found that the people with the lowest starting point, lower than 0.35, um, showed a significant improvement when you compare it to kind of people that ha already had a medium to high starting point. And that's important, again, for making recommendations to patients that who should we be recommending supplements to? How high can we go? Um, moving to the last point of my, my, my lecture, I, we, we've heard very nicely today about the risk factors for age-related macular degeneration. We know what they are. The idea here is about um, optimization of those risk factors to reduce the burden that AMD. But one of the questions, and, and Toss Bernshaw will be presenting tomorrow data on how macular pigment relates to those risk factors. We have our own opinion on it, and we've published some data showing that the major risk factors, age, um, family history, and cigarette smoking are associated with a, a lack of this pigment. We've looked at that even in more detail in a recent publication, and now that we have value and data of over 500 people with full spatial profiles, um, we identified that there was a percentage of these people that actually had a, what we've termed as a central dip in their pigment profile. And when we started to notice this um, originally, and I discussed it with, with Randy and Jim Stringham when I was in America, and we felt that maybe there was just, um, you know, m something to do with the measurement, these bips and bumps would go away. But as we had access to the really large sample, you know, we've measured pigment in thousands of people now in Waterford, uh, I started to see this more and more often, particularly when we had opportunity to use um, the customized flicker with, with full spatial profile measurements. So I rang Billy and asked him what I should do, and he said, well, you need to do a bunch of measurements again on those people. And that's exactly what we did. And that's essentially um, where this paper came from. And we found that those people that had those central dips <clears throat> They were reproduced once we measured them again. But um, in addition to that, the dips were more common in older people and in people that <coughs> smoke cigarettes. And again, consistent with that parallel AMD risk factor macular pigment story. What does it mean? Here's, um, I've just averaged the, um, the values from those um, subjects. 58 of them from the database I had available, 12%. You get this kind of volcano looking um, uh, shape. The important thing here is that People with lots of macular pigment also have central dips, if you accept my term as being a central dip. It's not just something that's common in people with, who are deficient in this pigment. It's, it's this profile I see people with very low and very high, and that's reflected obviously in this volcano looking um, graph here. Um, so what did we do? We, we wanted to see could we fix that problem if you accept that the dip is a problem. And we can suggest that it may be given that you, one would have less light filtration or antioxidant capacity um, there. So we invited them back, all of them, and we managed to get um, 31 of them back um, to take part in an interventional trial. So we did that. And again, the um, intervention was the same as what we did three groups, high mesozeaxanthin group, uh, high lutein group, and a combined effort. And this is what we found. This busy slide essentially shows you that the significant change over time was seen only in group two and group three, and only at the very center. And it'll make more sense when you look at it this way. Here's the first group of subjects. They're, they were randomly assigned to the uh, lutein intervention. You can see here that there was very little difference between baseline and end study visit with respect to their spatial profile. One subject actually did uh, respond to the lutein in, in, in this group, um, and that's why you get that uh, slight shift up there. But the statistical conclusion here is that there was no significant change over time in, in the profile. <clears throat> when we look at the mesozeaxanthin group, 
this is the 18 milligram group, you can see a, a different uh, result. You can see that there was a significant increase at, right at the very center where we've identified that dip. So I think it's important that it shows you that they respond in the serum and we can see these dramatic effects um, in the eye. Now I'd like to make the point here that you do not see such a dramatic response um, with mesozeaxanthin in subjects that do not have the dips. This, this really you know, striking image happens when, when you uniquely select these individuals with central dips. So, um, but here's the overall story. If you give them the combined effect, again, this is consistent with, um, I think, with the suggestion from Paul's work, um, you can augment the pigment across its entire spatial profile. And again, I, I find this data uh, very striking indeed. Um, to finish up, obviously, what does this all mean? We need to now test this clinically. Um, as I said, in Ireland, Professor Beattie has been um, working on macular pigment and looking at the science and as things have changed, his recommendations have changed, but I know he's been um, working with mesozeaxanthin and clinically, um, it's, I received maybe two, three letters a month from um, Professor Beattie's clinic on patients that he um, has noticed improvements um, in, in their degeneration. Maybe it's subjective or maybe it's actual looking at, at the disease itself. Of course, we need to test this in a proper clinical setting, and that's in fact what we're doing at the minute. Again, the Howard Foundation have supported this effort. We're working with um, Ron Klein and his team in Wisconsin. As we speak, images are being sent across um, the globe to, to Ron's lab for full grading. We do stereo um, retinal imaging, and that's the primary outcome measure here. We're going to follow the patients for two years. Some patients have already, be follow have already been followed for 18 months. So this is data that, that, that's going to come. We were also, of course, measuring serum and macular pigment levels in these patients. We're also doing retinal sensitivity. So this is data that I, I personally look forward to seeing. Most vision, we're, we're looking at um, vision. James Lockman and his team are working with us to look at um, visual performance response to um, mesozeaxanthin. Um, and lastly, as I say, I, ve I very proudly stand here to tell you that um, on last Friday I got good news from Brussels, which um, was a commitment of sim significant amount of funding to, to, to myself and our team to continue this um, research effort in Waterford. So um, the idea here is double-blind clinical trials with five years of funding. We're looking for two PhD students, so anyone in this room that feels they want to um, apply to work with us, it's an opportunity for you and um, we're really delighted to be given that opportunity. So that's my plan for the next decade, Lisa. Um, so we'll see how, how it goes. Um, so the idea is we can, we can achieve this, right? And it's, it'll take a, a mammoth effort. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>